So we are excited that you're here with us today at Open Ed Live. We are elated to welcome our keynote, my esteemed colleague, Dr. Jonathan Lashley manages academic innovation and collaboration initiatives between the Gem States colleges and universities. That's in Idaho. Dr. Lashley is perhaps better known for their work as a practitioner, advocate, as a leader in the modern open education space and movement. Having supported open learning initiatives and organizations across North America, Dr. Lashley's research, as, as well as today's talk, explores how the intersections of technology, identity, values, influence educational practice. Please help me welcome Dr. Jonathan Lashley. Thanks, Amanda. Thanks, everyone. It is such an honor to be here. I spent seven and a half years of my adult life and my education career working at Clemson University in Clemson, South Carolina. And I reached out to folks at UCF on a regular basis. Uh, they were aspirational in many regards. It was one of those institutions that had a more mature online learning presence, more mature digital learning presence. They had moved to Canvas before we did, and they were also bigger than Clemson. And so the mantra that I usually put forward was that if UCF is doing it and doing it well, surely Clemson can as well. Uh, to that end, let me share my screen so we can get this presentation underway. Hey, um, keynotes are weird, right? So with that, uh, and if you were able to catch any of the dramatic music, uh, my goal is to have some fun this hour, uh, to try and keep it a little bit lighter, a little bit more collaborative. That said, I um, must warn you, I am a, I'm someone who's been fairly multidisciplinary in my academic path to where I am now. And what that means is I, hold on. All right, can you see the slides? Let's ask that question. You see a slide that says AI openness and our educative returns. Yes. Perfect, okay. So anyway, going back. Um, my early academic career was in composition and rhetoric. I have never fully escaped that field, even when I moved into learning sciences and um, broader discussions of open education. I, I really like to consider open education a discipline. It doesn't have all the, the trappings, but it also means it doesn't have all the baggage. And so, with that, you're gonna get a bit of an amalgamation of my experience and the philosophy and the research that undergirds my practice and some of the choices that I've made as a academic administrator in Idaho in support of um, educators broadly defined. And I'm also going to caution you that though I, I have learned that UCF uh, has a preoccupation with AI, uh, you'll be surprised I doubt to learn that uh, Idaho also has a preoccupation with AI and its implications for educational practice. That said, I do not consider myself a uh, AI expert. I don't know how you can be. I stopped looking for examples and new information about AI yesterday, and it means that some of the examples that are in this presentation are already out of date. But what I also thought was interesting in preparation for this conversation is just how much the disruptive qualities of AI in education mirror maybe the less threatening but disruptive nonetheless qualities that have existed in the open education movement as we've known it, as I've seen it over the last 10 to 15 years. And so my goal is to work with you all to co-construct some knowledge and some strategies about how we might protect our values, uh, recognize our agency where it exists, and really return to uh, the qualities of education that make it educative, which we'll dive into here in just a moment. So first things first, I need to reorient around my various screens here. I apologize for my darting eyes, but that's why we have a slide deck. So first and foremost, um, when I say co-construct knowledge, I actually mean it. We are going to be working in two separate places today. I'm going to have my standard Sage on the Stage slide deck that I'll move through um, as quickly as seems practical. And in the meanwhile, there is a shared document that you can access either through uh, scanning that QR code or this direct link that I just posted in the chat. 
Uh, this document has questions that I'm going to prompt throughout this presentation uh, that I would love for anyone and everyone who's attending to answer. Uh, you'll see that some folks already have because um, for reasons that we'll get to in this presentation, I've already shared this work with my colleagues in Idaho. Um, and so they've already been kind enough to participate in, in some really striking ways. But we have three questions we're going to tackle in this document. There's also an opportunity to add your name as well if you'd like to be credited as a co-author on this work. And I figure, you know, what better way to really kick off an Open Education Week celebration than collaboratively creating an OER itself. So first, and I warned you, um, I'm, I'm a composition nerd, I'm a language nerd. So we're gonna start with some words because I, uh, like to grapple with really hairy and philosophical concepts and research in terms of terminology. First and foremost, AI, uh, if you didn't already get this impression, I'm gonna keep it light, really going to just use AI as a catch hold general reference to talk about these new uh, or newer and unfolding advances in general artificial intelligence and large language models. And one of the reasons, practical reasons to keep it high level is there's just a lot of uncertainty in this space. Uh, there has been since last year, but I'd also argue there has been since well before last year. Um, AI in its role in classrooms and restructuring or mediating um, our work or students' work is not necessarily new. Some of it is more sophisticated. Um, some of it seems more striking and disruptive and surprising. Some of it actually is. Uh, but what I find tends to be most disruptive about AI is just how um, strong everyone's opinion is about it, which I think is maybe part and parcel for how AI and large language models also behave. Um, if you've spent any time with ChatGPT, you'll recognize that it's very, very confident in everything that it does. Um, and I think as an offshoot of that, we also see a lot of confident conjecture on either sides. Uh, one argument that really stood out to me last week, though, was uh, there was some traction on Twitter, uh, which I still call Twitter and I still monitor for various reasons that I can't fully explain to myself or to others. Uh, but there was a lot of conversation around trying to put out there, let's pump the brakes and let's consider a reality where maybe AI is not inevitable in education. And I don't know that I found that the most productive train of thought. And it's largely because again, AI has already existed in things like uh, Grammarly and other tools that have become pretty commonplace in what we do. It's embedded in a lot of the tools that we use and rely on as part of our, our work as educators. And the reality is it's going to exist, exist outside of education as well. And I think we've seen in the past, the folly of presuming that we can um, wall off certain tools as for school only or for public consumption only. And in reality, um, I do think it's still useful to pay attention. And one of the ways I like to pay attention is using a concept that John Dewey fleshed out in 1913, which is um, drawing a distinct line between what is educational and what is educative. Educative meaning that it has the capacity to educate and really what, where that's perceived is in um, someone's deliberate acts, someone's deliberate performances. To give you an example, when I was an undergraduate student, I realized as a first semester freshman that I wanted nothing more than to be a college professor. It seemed like the ultimate mortal existence um, to just hang out and have diff difficult and challenging conversations with other academics and produce scholarship and teach classes. And to this day, there's still a few things I enjoy more than teaching a, a class full of college students, especially first year writing. But what that also meant for someone like me as an undergraduate student who had this very clear vision of what I wanted to do was that I took two sets of notes in every single one of my classes, regardless of if it was in, in major or not. Um, I would divide a line right down the page and I would have notes about the content, the educational content of the course. And then I would take note about what was educative. And this is long before I understood um, or, or come across Dewey's use of the term, where I was observing what were the faculty members doing in these classes um, what did I think worked, what I think didn't work, and how was that helping me learn how to also teach myself? And uh, this might not be surprising to those of you who have 
read a lot of John Dewey's work, and he situates a lot of his understanding of the world and practice around observing children and how they learn. And I found that when I became a parent, I also had um, way more understanding about the term educative and more examples to draw from. Um, and here's just one that I've been thinking about recently, which is one of the first things my daughter really felt interested in drawing was, was mermaids. And one really interesting or striking, um, if you want to use AI terminology, hallucination, I would say simulation of her pursuing the act of drawing a mermaid was that she omitted arms on a regular basis. Well, my uh, mentor in rhetoric and composition, Cynthia Haynes, uh, taught me and other grad students many years ago that if you see a connection, a connection exists. And because my worldview is different than my daughter's, it's more expansive, it, um, it, it's just different. I could immediately make associations with what I knew of Japanese visual culture and that you know not all mermaids have the pronounced or romanticized feminine qualities that we associate with maybe the little mermaid, but in Japan, the Nino, um, they come in a variety of different shapes, but really they are they are more specifically fish people or fish women. And it's not uncommon for appendages to be omitted or other anatomical, anatomical body parts would be attached to um, uh, the female form. And so with that, my daughter set an educative example where it didn't matter that she was drawing mermaids in a way that was not conventional to the Western standard or the influences that she was immersed in, what was most important was that she was acting on her interests. And I think that's, I think kids and, and my daughter in particular, super inspiring um, because she's an educator. I think we're all educators. If we take the, the term educative and we apply it to any person who's acting deliberately, um, others who observe those acts is bound, I mean, they're bound to learn something. And so what's another thing I wanna put out there, I'll be using these terms a lot. I didn't feel it was necessary to call them out, but uh, those of you who have heard me talk before, especially about identity, you may have heard me use the terms ethos and athea. Uh, you might've also heard these terms in your first year writing class as part of the uh, Holy Rhetorical Trilogy, the ethos, pathos, and logos. Uh, in modern language, Athea is the pluralized form of ethos, but it had a very specific meaning in ancient Greece, and it's really well exemplified in um, specifically Homer's the Iliad, where once loosed, a horse would run out into an open field and frolic and play and really just embody their natural way of being, their natural self. It was a habitat. So the Athea of ancient Greece were habitats. The Athea on this screen is a hallucination that... Um, uh, Dolly made for me, uh, and you'll notice that some of the horses are, um, you know, quite striking. And also, it's clear they interpreted Athea as ethereal. But I think that is also really it's a it's a prescient point in the context of if ethos and Athea are sort of these irrational forms, this just natural feeling of of who we are and where we want to reside. The rational forms, logos, also often referred to as the written word. Um, in these conversations. I mean, Logos is the language of large language models. It's the language of chat GPT. It deals in rationality. And that's where when we see what folks call hallucinations, but are really more accurately simulations, it's simulations based on a logic that runs into itself. So thinking more specifically about educators and identity, um, I have a framework that I, I find really useful that I developed a few years ago um, during my dissertation research. I've now presented on this about 10 times. And so I think that means that this is the year that I need to actually do some form formal scholarship or produce something related to this research. But uh, by combining values coding from Johnny Saldana and the analytical lens of identity that James G puts out there, both for social scientific research found this really interesting conversation if you put ethos in the middle of it. This idea that our attitudes, our values and beliefs are constitutive of various um, negotiations, negotiations of identity. And what's I think really important for the role of an educator, and this is part of the, the icebreaker of course, was that we have institutional affiliations and those institutional affiliations 
really do structure our attitudes and beliefs about what is possible in the work that we do as educators. And sometimes they also run completely outside of our values as educators. And that's something that um, not only will we explore today, but it's just as relevant, that sort of consideration to AI and the uncertainty that exists in that area as it is with openness and open education. And so let's dive into that. With openness, um, I, I was very deliberate in using this term, not only because I looked ahead at the program and I saw that there's a bunch of really great programming around uh, open practices and OER and open textbooks and so on, but I like openness as a means of inquiry, as a critical lens that we can use to consider educational resources, to, con to consider our practices on a spectrum of openness. And that spectrum might have everything from, as Amanda mentioned earlier, the democratization of knowledge and access to education as a human right, uh, to a, a constrained and, and in some ways, maybe ironically constrained conception of what open is because it becomes intimidating when you just say something's open and you still ex expect people to use or transform something that you, that you consider open. Um, it's hard to know where to start. And so open licenses came from the practical utility and practical purpose of how do we direct people on what to do? And that's really buoyed by a lot of our definitions of open. So to just offer some uh, quick and dirty examples, uh, David Wiley, who coined open content and is largely credited with a lot of how we understand the way permission structures work with open licenses, uh, originally defined open as free plus permissions. Later, he referred to it as a free granting of permissions. The permissions being, um, okay, you have content, it's available, it's free, and the author is allowing you or permitting you to transform it in various ways. Um, I, I liked Ryan Merkley's kind of response to that or building off of that where there's the, the five R's of open education. It's something that gets thrown around a lot and we'll talk about that in the next slide. But these five R's are based in the permission structure set or described by open licenses. And by pursuing um, that transformation, those five R's, you're creating additional value for the educational resource itself. Now, Again, grappling with the technical, grappling with the philosophical, I'm sort of just smitten with the quote that my colleague Christina Hendricks found um, from a book in the 70s where someone was referring, discussing the open education movement, reflecting on just the term open itself and how just generally good it makes us feel, how viscerally we respond to the word open, and that um, you may as well just consider open yum. It's good sloganeering, and I, uh, I'm inclined to agree. So when I talk about open licenses, uh, there's a variety of different open licenses out there in the open education movement. Creative Commons is the one that's maybe the most used or at least the most common. It's held up to the test of time, I think, in terms of really clearly conveying what you can do with open content. Um, and then these are the five R's that I was describing. So the ability to retain, to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute educational resources or educational content. Again, um, in an effort to democratize knowledge and enhance access. And the last breakdown I'm going to give in this quick and dirty rundown of open education is just kind of the interplay of some of these words and topics. I try to be fairly deliberate in using them, but I recognize that as, as um, Amanda prompted, you know, there's a variety of different experience levels in this group. And so, you know, we could spend 50 minutes just digging into this one slide alone. But the modern open education movement really does depend on the engine of open licenses to help convey uh, what use can look like, what transformation can look like of educational content that was authored by others. And so when you apply an open license to a piece of content in the process, you're creating an open educational resource. Um, and I'm inclined in the same way that we're all educators to consider any resource that has an open license attached to it and could be used to teach anybody anything could be considered an open educational resource. There was a faculty member who I worked with a number of years back who was a philosophy professor. He, for his course materials, I can't remember if it was that his department couldn't, wouldn't allow him to use open resources or if he just couldn't find what he wanted. But what he did like was that in terms of building assignments, uh, building exams, 
he would find examples of phil philosophical concepts in openly licensed images. Those images in the context of being part of an assessment to prompt an example of what the physics concept looks like in real life became an open educational resource just through that use. And then even larger than that is the whole idea of open educational practices. These are the practices that create yum for us as educators that are really predicated on sharing, sharing broadly, sharing widely, sharing sustainably. Um, sustainable practice is an incredibly important part of the open education movement. And I would argue it should just be an incredibly important part of being an educator or being an education professional. And so all these three things built on sustainability, um, trying to engender models of sustainable practice and use and reuse in education, they largely constitute the open education movement as we know it. And to give you a recent example from Idaho, my colleague, Amy Minervini, because she has access to press books, because she is well-versed in not only open licenses, because she's certified in Creative Commons licensing, but also she's just uh, a really talented educator. Uh, she was working on a, she was teaching a class in developmental writing and create an opportunity where not only could the students help craft the content of this book that they end up publishing at the end of the semester, Music in Your Words, but now this is a book that can continue to be edited and updated with future students in this class. And this is kind of a big deal uh, for anyone who's familiar with developmental writing or has ever taught developmental writing. Um, often these are students who come into college level writing courses with a lot of trauma or insecurity and the fact that they would not only um, be willing to help author a textbook, um, but then maybe even maintain it, and that it would create opportunities for others to find new value in their learning opportunities beyond just writing papers that are going to be dis disregarded by either the teacher or the student at some point. Um, it's fairly transformative educational practice, and open licenses are associated with it, but really this can exist without open education, even knowing about open education. This is just what openness looks like in practice. And furthermore, not only did they create a resource, but now this has created opportunities where Amy and her students are conducting workshops uh, in the state of Idaho. They're applying to go to conferences to talk about their work together, collaborating as educators. The idea being that the students are just as much an educator as Amy is in these contexts. And now the big one for the day is one that I've grappled with a lot, especially since the pandemic. One of the areas of rhetorical theory that I, I focus a lot on was hospitality, but also as a counter to that crisis. Um, and, and I, again, I think about what terms are operational and what terms are really useful. And I think uncertainty is probably a better term than crisis or disruption because uncertainty conveys that this reality is still unfolding. We do not yet know what the implications are going to be, how we're going to have to renegotiate our own practices, or how we're going to have to um, pursue something different, something that we didn't know, something that makes us uncomfortable. And so generally for the, the rest of this conversation, uncertainty really has to deal with those things that cause us concern, might be AI, might be related to open education, might be something completely different. And to just give an example about AI, because I was asked to, to talk about AI, and it's something that we talk about a lot in Idaho, uh, something that we've done as a limited group, which has its own problems, is to try and get ahead of it, but also not constrain ourselves through something as formal as policy, is to develop some principles, some statewide principles with representation from all the institutions around how we want to navigate or renegotiate our practice when it comes to generally a general generative AI in higher education. Um, people are first and that's the first one. And I think that's probably going to persist. An inquiry mindset is useful. Equitable access is necessary. Uh, responsive teaching probably still matters if not matters more than ever. Copyright and privacy. There's new implications for this at the same time um, there were old implications that weren't particularly well dealt with regarding our IP and who owns what um, in the work of, of an educator. And then furthermore, transparency is essential, but transparency 
And what that looks like in practice can have a range of different um, outcomes. And so for instance, when I'm grappling with perpetual um, uncertainty in something that's new, I look for local inspiration. And fortunately, I have great colleagues in Idaho. Uh, folks like Joel Glad and Liza Long, I know Liza's um, on the call and I'm grateful for that. But they wrote an open textbook years ago with um, Amy Minervini actually. And they recently updated it to add a chapter about teaching with artificial intelligence because it's, it's, it's as important to provide resources of how to teach with their materials as it is to provide the content itself for the course. Uh, Liza, I know, has also been piloting my essay feedback, which is an AI-driven tool to provide just-in-time um, AI-driven feedback to students on their writing to, to sort of help maintain motivation and offer some sort of um, facilitated or simulated one-on-one -on -one feedback. Uh, Lice is a great example of a faculty member who, when given the right resources and support, uh, is willing to be educative and go out there and experiment and play and share back with others so that we can learn. And so watching her pilot and talk about this tool has inspired me to consider piloting in my own course um, this semester. Uh, Reed Hepler, uh, he's a library colleague at the College of Southern Idaho, and I, I had to reference his consulting firm. He just decided to spin up. I don't know where he has the time, but he's also, um, it's not just that he considers himself the AI guy, or at least that's his tagline, but the reality is he's out there um, right now, it seems like all over LinkedIn, doing everything from trying to find co-authors for textbook chapters on AI that, are, that can be openly published to generally just sifting through all of that noise I showed in that earlier slide to help uh, folks like me who don't have the bandwidth, who need to focus on other areas, try and keep track of everything. And then last week I was in a conversation as part of this greater statewide AI initiative. And I got to connect with a colleague of mine at Boise State who teaches writing in Brittany. And I just, found her her general philosophy inspiring. Again, both she and I have seen the use of Grammarly and other AI assisted tools, plagiarism checkers, if you will, that's a great example, that have already infiltrated our classroom. And she offered a pretty interesting thought project that I'm still kind of grappling with even in my own classes, which is if I just assume that AI is happening and it's integrated in every system that my students are using, what material difference does that make and how I'm gonna teach this class how I'm going to design my assignments and so on. And I'm not the only lucky one. You all also have dedicated resources locally uh, in UCF. I'm not gonna be in Orlando in July, but for those of you who are, um, chances are if you wanna dive deeper into AI than I'm able to get today, this is going to be a really great conference for you to do that. So all that said, I think this is a good springboard for our first question, which I've talked about you know, some degrees of uncertainty, but I want it to be more general than that. I really want you to think about what is that greatest cause of uncertainty in your work right now as an educator? Um, and you'll notice on the document that there are a variety of causes already listed, uh, and many of them defy just AI or openness alone, even though those are also great causes of uncertainty. And so please do not feel bad about you know, filling in responses and working in that document while I'm sharing. There is going to be a recording if you need to miss anything. And we'll see if there's also time for questions at the end. The example that I really want to focus on today, though, is one that's close to my work at the state level. I work for the State Board of Education in Idaho. Uh, they oversee K through 20 education, even though my work is predominantly post-secondary in scope. And my work has changed. Um, I've, I've actually served in three different capacities for the state board in the last uh, five years or so. And this example comes from my first appointment with them where I was one of two academic officers. And I found myself in a deeply concerning and um, uncertain place because I was a practitioner in open education at the institution level, going to work for the state, and what I did not know, despite the fact I had served as a subject matter expert for a previous academic officer, uh, he had kind of just pushed through a policy on open education. And generally, I think um, he and the board members who passed it 
thought that this was the right move, that this was going to be useful, that um, maybe even their act of creating policy could be seen as educative. Like, look, we care so much about open educational resources, we made a policy about it. The trouble was, and Dewey highlights this as well, that there's also um, ways in which acts can be uneducative or miseducative. So with uneducative, um, at least in the case of policies, an uneducative act is something that is based in little awareness or authentic interest. And so it's really just um, a general sense of uncertainty that's sponsoring an outcome in policy. And now for the miseducative, it's that we have a policy, but we're not quite sure where we're going. And, you know, unfortunately, when it comes to policy, and especially the implementation of that policy, it's not really true that if you don't know where you're going, any road's going to take you there, because the whole point of approving and drafting and passing a policy is that it would be, get implemented in material ways. So what this looked like in policy development, and largely this was academic policy development at the board office before I came in, was that you had a pretty strong disconnect between the decision makers at the state level and the practitioners at the institution level. And so at somewhere along the line, whether you had existing policy or not, the board office had drafted a policy. Um, don't know to what end necessarily, don't know to what degree they, they solicited input. Um, so then the board would approve that policy. We don't know if it was under political influences or some other influences. We also don't know how aware they were necessarily, because again, those who were working at the institution level, those who were doing the work and would most feel the consequences of this policy, they might not have been consulted. And then almost the, the worst part is when it comes to the comes time for the implement, implementation of policy at the institution level, you might have in writing a policy that has certain specifications, but because you didn't consult practitioners or experts in the process, we don't know what form it takes, if the language is actually specific enough, if it actually creates conflict with what we're already doing. And we don't know by what means or resources an institution can reasonably implement the policy. Are all, in the case of Idaho, we have four community colleges and four four-year institutions. Are they all supposed to implement every academic policy the same, recognizing that their culture is different, their infrastructure is different, their faculty is different, their student cohorts are different, and so on. And so you're really left with kind of two scenarios. You have ends in search of proper means, proper means of implementing policy, or you have means without an end. And this was actually very common for a lot of the policies that I inherited when I moved into academic officer work at the state, where the board on one side and the institutions on the other would be asking the same question, but talking past each other. And it's like, well, when do we know that we finally implemented this policy? When do we know we've reached the finish line? And so based on my research and experience in change management, started trying to develop uh, and, and, and influenced by notions of what's, what is and is not educative, I tried to build some sort of um, policy development framework around development and implementation. Uh, implementation was a large part of my job in particular. And so the goal was I have direct access to the most educated and some of those passionate thinkers in the state. Why wouldn't I try to learn from them and go directly to them? And importantly, why not go to anyone who's willing to um, engage or inspire or frustrate their colleagues because they're so active in their participation in their, in their practice. And it's in, in my experience, though I'm also biased in this regard because I am, I am a divisive faculty member as well in terms of I'm very justice oriented. I generally don't take no for an answer very lightly and will try and engineer my own outcomes to fit the needs of my students or my values as an educator, but because of that experience and because of working with other faculty like that, I know that tension in conversation and difficulty in finding um, consensus with such faculty or educators means that they care. And those are exactly the right people that you want to be engaging with at the practitioner level. Next, it's a matter of renegotiation. It's not, if, you're, if I'm truly entering into these conversations as a learner, 
I know what my interests are, but I don't know what I'm going to learn. And so renegotiation is a given, and it means that I need to host equitable conversations about what is possible, what is desirable. I really need to practice active learning and join in the uncertainty of the moments, of the potential change, and, and so on. Because we don't, we may not know from a policy standpoint what implementation is going to do materially at the institution level. But again, if you see a connection, a connection exists, and it's worth exploring all those potentialities with those who might feel the impact the most. And then um, it's my responsibility, if I've su successfully uh, learned, to then share back and to educate and to model what I learned, because ultimately that's going to be the, the full assessment of was I an active learner? Did I really listen? Um, and part of it is recognizing, uh, I, I like I like using the word recognize instead of um, assessing in this context, but recognizing where are educators or practitioners already at, where are they finding success and entertaining that that might actually be part of the solution as well. So the limitation of that earlier policy to support open education was that it directly defied or just dismissed the idea that faculty at the institution level were already doing a lot of work to promote access, promote affordability of instructional materials in their courses. It may just not have been OER, but because the policy was only exclusively focused on OER, they felt like their work wasn't good enough and why would they share it or why would they participate moving forward? So to that, we have another prompt and this is question two. What do you value as an educator and how do you express your values when facing uncertainty? Going back to my um, case of fact finding and learning, this wasn't the most difficult process for me in this particular policy because I was, again, already a practitioner coming from the institutions and I was aware of not only what my interests were philosophically to see the proliferation of um, openness and open practices in the state of Idaho, but I, I wanted to make sure that we had a sustainable means of maintaining the AFEA that practitioners valued in their practice. And so was there openness? And, and in what that looked like in Idaho is, were we going to structure regular statewide engagement with infinity and, and, and inquiry groups, recognizing that though maybe it hasn't been unfolding as quickly as AI has in conversation, open education has changed a lot since I got into it. Um, early in my, my teaching career. Next, from a pedagogical standpoint, how are we aligning our policy and our interests in academic practice with actual teaching and learning goals? That which practitioners were already protective of, and if they felt like they were under threat, they were likely hiding. And these are the things that we wanna celebrate. And so importantly, moving on to a point of advocacy, how can the state, how can policymakers have stakes in formally recognizing and promoting what a pra effective practice looks like. And again, recognizing that effective practices, practice already exists. It just may not be recognized or it might be withheld because that layer of trust isn't there because folks just aren't stepping up to learn. And then finally, providing opportunities for leadership, giving power to those closest to the pain, giving opportunities for those who are practitioners, who are effective, who have a story to tell, finding ways to help them tell their story, to feel secure and safe in doing so, because we all benefit from that educative example. So what happened is we had a policy on textbook and instructional material affordability, which was really just structured around cost and OER. And it became a policy on instructional material access and affordability. So it was not just about um, cost, but in fact, we were talking about the affordances of open access, open materials, low cost materials, and the variety of practices that help drive down costs, that promote access, and also importantly, increase the value of learning opportunities. Again, a really good example is just that recent textbook that Amy Minervini authored with her students. And lo and behold, the policy got bigger, but it also got clearer. And it became an educative process in itself. This became the notes. This became us showing our work that we learned something. We learned how to represent the interests of our academic community, broadly defined, and also um, honor the culture that was specific not only to our institutions, but to the state that we, that we resided in. 
And so the new policy, and it hasn't been updated since, it recognizes existing efforts. It provides the resources that were most desired by the practitioners of our state. And it says that the state should be on the hook. If we want faculty, if we want educators to be doing work aligned with openness, then we need to help provide them the resources, technical or otherwise, that they need in order to do the work. Uh, it allowed us to help align policies, policies and vocabularies between institutions so that more effective collaboration could be sponsored. We found means of advocating with institution leadership then to reward any of the experiments that folks were doing under the banner of openness as scholarly behavior that was valued and worth reward. And at the end of the day, it's a policy that even though it affects eight institutions, and for those institutions and community colleges, they just decide to opt in because they recognize that the benefits, the material benefits of having these resources and the support was useful to them. It could be interpreted however they needed it to be, the stipulations, the plans that each institution had to set up because that was, a, that was the outcome. Every institution had to have a plan for how they were going to support open practices or affordability practices or access practices on their campus. But that allowed enough wiggle room so that every institution could right size it around the needs of their practitioners, their students, and so on, really honoring culture. And so under educative policy implementation, we see a new change where policy is in a perpetual state of redevelopment, continuous improvement with co-creation from practitioners. I should note that the practitioners, those people who are impassioned and care a whole lot that I engaged with to learn from, I also gave them the platform to co-author the text of that, that policy with us. And I wouldn't have had it any other way. And in fact, that's now been a driving force in how we conduct policy writing um, in the state of Idaho. Next, with the board approving and updating policy, they have enhanced awareness about existing and possible practices because again, those are drawn straight from the values and the actual lived experiences of our institutions themselves. And then further institutions implement with policy, they implement the policy with culture in mind. And they do so with support where they're not going on their own. It's not a case of a state level policy is passed and then hand off to the institutions and they're told to figure it out, but they have partners in us and in their, their counterpart institutions across our state. And so this was a case where to be educative, it meant the state needed to show up and show out to, rene to renegotiate certainty. And now this gets us to the point. So thanks for indulging me with this example. But like the point is, in my mind, in my experience, perpetual educative activity curbs perpetual uncertainty. As educators, we do not benefit from existing vac in, in vacuums. We exist in being in spaces like this, often and regularly and participating, where we can draw on others and we can learn from others and we can observe what really grabs us, what connects with us and what we might wanna bring into our own work. And to, so with that, I present you the third question if you haven't already tackled it, which is how might you set more educative examples for others, other educators in particular, by renegotiating uncertainty. And all of this comes under what I think is like my favorite definition of learning I've ever come across by Etienne Winger, in that learning is a social becoming. It's not um, in pursuit of a fixed state. It's, you know, to, to learn is to struggle. Um, what's great is, you know, I'm not the only one who thinks in terms of uncertainty. Uh, Dave Cormier just put out a really great book um, that I know I have a reference to in the document. I highly recommend you check it out. But he actually positions uncertainty as a powerful motivational force. And that when you feel uncertain or uncomfortable, that's how you know that learning is happening. And I'd much rather suffer that in a group with other people who are dedicated and, and share my values than suffer that alone. And so as you work ahead this week in these presentations and, and as you fill out this document um, and as you pursue the, the work that you have the rest of the semester, I really encourage you seek educative play, find that ethos, that place that's natural um, to collaborate with other educators. It's not to say that the AFEA is you know, all fun and games. There's of course conflict between those who feel comfortable and settled and like they're in their habitat. 
But it's really our ethical imperative if we believe in openness, if we want to practice openly, that we share and we share well with others. And also to just get over our concerns about how uncertainty can be paralyzing and how we might take a, mess, uh, take a wrong step. Because as my wonderful, incredible, educative daughter, the artist, remind me with hands down my favorite drawing ever when she asked me what I want her to draw. And I said, the red panda. And she drew me a red panda. And she was learning to write at the time by just copying words that she found around the house. She came up with nothing matters and a red panda. And that's an example that I use as a mantra, as a means to just remember what's important. And what's important is pursuing my interests, pursuing my values and my practices as an educator. And I hope you feel the same way too. And with that, I want to say thank you because we learned some stuff today. We became socially and we even crafted an OER in the process. And I think we have time 